Okay. Uh, dobrý večer všetkým, vítam vás na dnešnej prednáške v sérii Reflexie architektúry. Uh, ďakujem, že ste prišli, uh, že ste s nami prípadne aj online. Uh, I will now switch to English. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to next uh, lecture in our uh, this year series on, uh, on uh, Polish architecture. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, our dear guest um, uh, Zygmunt Borowski, uh, architect from AA Collective, uh, actually a Polish studio, which is, I would say, not really Polish, but very international, but uh, 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 Zygmunt will uh, definitely explain everything behind the idea of the, of the studio. I would uh, just like to add that uh, he... Mm, he's quite a young architect, but very experienced one, because <laughs> uh, you are probably quite familiar with the name uh, of the very famous Swiss architect, uh, Keres, and uh, he, was, he was working for him, so I mean, this is quite an interesting experience uh, for an architect. Uh, what is also interesting that uh, all the architects from, from AA Collective, they actually met at the Academia di Architectura di Mendrisio, which is a very interesting uh, school of architecture in northern Italy. But uh, we will probably discover more about this during the lecture. Uh, AA Collective uh, uh, does not only architecture, but also writing, uh, exhibitions, and uh, I would say generally like uh, thinking uh, in the frame of architecture, teaching, etc., etc. So I will not um, waste uh, time of our dear guest and of you, and uh, I will deliver now the micro to him. And, and yeah, thank you for uh, being here, and we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction and for inviting me here. Um, my name is Sigmund Borowski and um, I will tell you a bit on the work that we do with our uh, collective, uh, which is called AA Collective, um, how we work collectively. Um, basically, this is us. Um, it's uh, Serjan uh, Zlokapa, who is... Uh, um, was born in Sarajevo when uh, it was still Yugoslavia and uh, his parents emigrated to Italy and he spent most of his life in Trieste, this is where he grew up. Um, Furio Montoli is um, half Japanese, uh, actually Korean, but his family, a Japanese uh, Korean family emigrated to Japan after the Second World War and he's half Italian and he spent most of his life in Milano I met both Serjan and Furio at the Academia. And then there is Martin Marker, who is Danish, and we met in Basel. And the story was basically that uh, we were in, with Serjan in Paris, and we were just sightseeing. And uh, one evening when we were having a beer, I said, because we were very good friends already in the Academia, and we graduated together, and I said, uh, there is a competition for the Central Square in Warsaw. And, I was doing a very boring job in my office where I was employed and he was doing a very boring job at his office and we decided that the brain, which is a muscle that you need to train, uh, needed its training so we decided to do a competition together and uh, Sergeon said at that time, yeah, I know this guy, Martin, in Basel and he's also very good so let's just make a competition between us three and then also Furio joined. and. Uh, it was a two-stage two competition, which I will, of course, say later more about it. And, um, yeah, we won. And the first time I saw uh, Martin was on Skype. And the first time I saw him live was after we won uh, the competition. So when I saw him for the first time live, I first gave him the money for the competition. And then I said, hi, I'm Sigmund, so it's nice to meet you live, finally. Um, so yeah, and um, this is how we work. Um, we mainly did all of our projects, if not most of the pro all of the projects that we did till now, we did on Skype. But about this, I will say later. So this shows you more or less um, how we are spreaded around Europe. Martin lives in Copenhagen. I live in Warsaw. 
but also a bit in Mindrisio, where now I'm a teaching assistant. Serjan lives in Basel, and Furio lives in Milano. So for us, this concept of Europe, uh, Europe without borders, Europe where everything is close, uh, all the places are close to each other, are available, you can travel just with an ID. This is, for us, uh, it's a concept that made our office work and that is extremely important for us. Um, so um, we see the concept of the European Union as one of the best political concepts ever made. So please don't forget about that and try to use it as much as possible because it is your future. And as long as Europe works, I think we are all in safe hands. So once after we won the competition for the Central Square in Warsaw, uh, one of the journalists asked us, hey guys, uh, where's your office? And I looked at Serjan, Serjan looked at me and he said, yeah, um, he was very witty about it. He said, yeah, somewhere between cheap flights and Skype. And uh, this is actually very true. This is how we worked and how we work till now. EasyJet, Ryanair, Wiz, Skype, Teams, and Zoom. These are our main sponsors. We do not receive any money from them, but uh, it would be actually nice to do receive. Um, the first project I want to tell, um, show you is an arch in southern Jutland that we did in 2021. Martin called us one day and said, yeah, I found this competition, let's do it. And we said, okay. So we called each other on Saturday and we did it in one day. Um, a local steel mill uh, in um, Kirstenfeld, in Kolding actually, and uh, the uh, mayor of Kolding decided to make a competition uh, that would celebrate the 100 years of reunification of southern Newtlands to the lands of Denmark. Basically, in 1866, what happened is that the Prussians decided to expand their country or their empire more than they did already in the previous 200 years, and they decided to attack Denmark. They obviously won because they had a much more skilled army, um, and they took uh, the northern lands of Schleswig-Holstein and the southern Jutland uh, from Denmark. So um, this also led four years later, I don't know if you're good in history or not, but this expansion, this Prussian exp ex expansion, had the episode of it was the war in 1870 against France that they also won one year later in 1871. And this is where Prussia also became uh, the Second Reich. They decided to reunite all the German lands and to create the Second Reich with the Kaiser as the chief of that. Um, then they lost um, 44 years, 48 years later, they lost the uh, First World War. And after that war, there was um, voting in the lands of Southern Newtland, uh, whether uh, the inhabitants want to be part again of Denmark or they want to be part of the Weimar Republic, and the voting was that these people wanted to get back to Denmark. So on that day, King Christian X in Christenfeld went through 13 gates that were built, 13 arches uh, that were built to celebrate the reunification. And um, this, is a, this comes from a tradition in Denmark that every 10 years when you're married, after every 10 years, you build an arch, um, on the door of your house in order to celebrate the wedding or the anniversary of the wedding. And this is what Denmark also wanted to do with the reunification of the lands. And 100 years later, in, 19, in 2020, um, the municipality of Kolding decided to make this competition with the local steel mill. The only thing that we, you needed to do in order to sort of be part of this competition or take part of this index competition was that you had to build it in steel. You had to design this in steel. So in one day, on Saturday morning, we sat down on Skype and we started drawing and thinking and talking about uh, what we want to achieve. And we realized that ma maybe a massive uh, arch in steel is not something that we want to create. We want something structural uh, that we could use like um, very typical steel bars that you use for construction. So we wanted to use typical elements in steel that would not have to be produced especially for the building of this arch. 
So we are also extremely interested in, um, in um, descriptive geometry. We are very bad at this when we were students. Actually, Surgeon was the only one who was good. But this is the only part in mathematics that I really enjoyed when I was in school, in architectural schools, and I always loved to do that drawings. And we decided that what we want to use is use these steel elements, but never to bend them, but just always to go with straight lines. And we realized that this would, be, uh, this would lead us to, a, to an arch uh, that would also remind us of uh, medieval arches that you would uh, usually build in medieval churches in Denmark. And we thought that this would be extremely contextual. So in this um, construction scheme, you can see how these wooden, this not wooden, steel bars, they are they always sort of change their position. They're welded to a certain outside structure. And then if you just gonna weld or put another bar always on top by just then um, sort of turning it, you receive an arch. You have to do it from both sides, of course. Um, and um, we won the competition. Uh, apparently unanimously, all the jury was, um, was very um, infatuated with the project. And the local steel mill decided to build it and um, it was created, created um, the arch was made with 16,000 16, weld, weldings. Um, and the local steel mill was so proud of the construction of this uh, arch that they wanted to uh, also um, not only construct it but also put it in place. Um, what happened is that we went there one day before the Queen of Denmark was supposed to go with the uh, chariot underneath the arch in order to celebrate this, um, this um, reunification or 100 years of the reunification. What we are also interested in is this ephemeris structure that would remind us how ephemeris can be also uh, the topic of nationality or independence uh, and also how this arch could be seen in uh, since it's so transparent that if you change your perspective or you change your position you always see this arch in a different perspective it changes a lot because it's this because of its structure so um, this is also a sort of a connotation that we had with the idea of nationality and the idea of independence. Uh, that is something extremely fragile, but if it's very well welded and the singular elements uh, work together um, for a common purpose, uh, maybe these, um, this can survive. Um, and this was the celebration. The queen went underneath the arch and then uh, she had a speech for an hour. And um, the most beautiful moment was at the end where all the local um, citizens gathered around the arch and um, continued celebrating. Nowadays, the arch is um, in Kolding um, at the riverfront and it's being used basically um, by the inhabitants of the city in the local park. And it's getting rusty and it's getting more and more beautiful, actually. The second project that I want to show you is, um, it's a project that we did for the um, Hungarian pavilion uh, at the Biennale in 2021. Um, it was a project that was um, called Modernity and it dealt with the social modernist heritage of architecture in Hungary. Um, 11, 11 offices from Eastern Europe or Central Eastern Europe were invited to uh, participate at this collective uh, project uh, organized by the Hungarian um, um, pavilion. And we were, the own, uh, we were the one of the two offices from Poland uh, we were considered a more international but based in Poland office. And we received uh, one building that was uh, located at the, um, uh, Castle Hill in uh, Budapest. So each office received one 
building um, from the social modernist uh, period, from the period between uh, after the Second World War until 1989. And we received the National Electric Distribution Center. And what the organizer wanted us to do is to sort of reinterpret these buildings or see them uh, cast a positive light on them, because there was a huge discussion in Hungary at the time whether they should keep this heritage or not, whether these buildings have a quality or not. And uh, the organizers thought, yes, they do have. And they wanted to invite these 11 offices in order to start thinking or um, invite them to think how we could nowadays reuse these buildings. Or, um, and we received the National Electric Distribution Center that was designed by Xava Firak in uh, 1974. And what was, interested, uh, what was interesting in the building is that it had this notion that we both, uh, we all very much enjoyed, that it was trying to be contextual in its form. You can see the pitch truth that sort of um, um, reflects on the local architecture of the, of the Castle Hill. But it was extremely modern in its usage of certain elements, like the glazed facade, uh, which is, um, is a reference to the, to the high-tech, um, a very filigrane structure. This, some, a notion that I really uh, much enjoy, which is the uh, late modern mirror glass architecture, which here is very much visible in this facade. But still, while being in its form quite uh, historical. And the, uh, it was not the only building, contemporary building, or uh, let's say a modern building that was built on that hill. Also the, the Hilton Hotel by Bella Pinter is, uh, is something that tries to sort of reflect on that's the same kind of uh, approach in architecture, in historical context. Uh, and one of the most, um, I, I would say, uh, appealing elements also in that, in that building was the, was the visible brutalist almost, well entirely brutalist, uh, staircase that um, looked like a medieval tower. And all of these notions in that building that was uh, extremely rich, uh, when, we end, when we saw the pictures, historical pictures of the interiors, we realized that this building is even better because it looks like uh, from a films of James Bond all these uh, very sort of tasty interiors with uh, unknown elements that we could not sort of decipher. Um, but even ventilation was designed in a very interesting way. Uh, it had these niches with singular sort of chairs that I don't know how you could use it besides just, I mean, resting, but there was no possibility of conversation between each other if you would sit down. Um, and it al almost looked futuristic, futurological, let's say. Um, and when we entered the building, it was already in, um, in a very bad shape. We arrived a bit too late with our uh, discussion on the future of this building because it was already decided by the local government that this needed to go, this building, and needs to be destroyed. So we said with the guys, okay, so what do we do? When we went out, from the building, and the organizer said, yeah, guys, um, yeah, it's a very bad thing, but uh, probably your building is the only building that we know 100% for sure that is going to be destroyed. And uh, we got quite sad because we sort of very much liked the architecture. And um, we uh, sat down and we said, if we cannot save it, let's celebrate its last days, and um, let's celebrate the death of the building. How does the building behave uh, in this uh, more, let's say, anthropological, in this, this anthropo anthropological notion of the death of someone? What do you do when somebody dies? You, uh, you put him in a grave, you, um, you make a funeral. And uh, we said, can we do the same with a building? Can we let it sort of, um, how do you say, um, can we... Um, oh God, um, let's go further. Um, we, when, when we went out of the building, we saw that 
on the inside it started to be, uh, they started dismantling everything. But on the outside, already some plants started to grow on the building. And we had this idea that maybe the best thing that we can do is to take all the elements from the building, take also the, um, the ceilings, and leave only the structure, and let nature take over the building. Um, so we would leave the bare structure uh, that would be the only element that would survive. And um, we decided to make a model to show this. And we thought that this would be the best thing that we could do with that building, is to create a uh, public space that would be a park where um, this building would be celebrated in its form, but the function of it would be given back to people again. So it would be a death of sort of your, as it would happen usually with when you die, so this, your, your, uh, your body would disappear, but the bones would remain. So this is how we wanted to sort of uh, celebrate this, uh, the death of this building. This was the exhibition that was then done in Venice. Uh, the, um, the pavilion was divided into uh, two uh, rooms. One with the drawings and the photographs of, the, of those buildings. And then the second room would be with this interpretation uh, of these buildings by uh, different offices from Central Eastern Europe. The sad thing is that what the local government proposed on the side of that building is the most horrid sort of um, way of, I think, um, going back to the certain historical architecture that is just pure facade, instead of having also the quality of a contemporary building or that would serve the contemporary society in a way that would also be able to represent it. But the main project that we are currently building is, and also this is the reason why the collective was created, was as I told you, one evening in Paris we had a beer and we decided to do this competition, is the Warsaw Central Square. It started in 2018, it was a two-stage competition, and um, our idea was basically to deal with the past, again, uh, but to use it as a tool that would represent the future um, ambitions of our city. We are in the central part of Warsaw, like you cannot be more central than that. You have the Palace of Culture that was built in between 1953 and 1955 um, on the remains of the 19th century city. The communists, of course, when they took over Poland after the Second World War and Warsaw was completely destroyed by 90% of the urban fabric was raised to the ground, um, decided that uh, Warsaw can be rebuilt. The old town was rebuilt. But definitely they would not accept the rebuilding of the 19th century urban fabric that was purely bourgeois. They said, Warsaw is not a bourgeois city, we will not let it raise, I mean, we will not um, let it uh, be rebuilt in the same way it was before the war. So this is the picture, the satellite picture from Google Map that shows you the current situation. This is the same situation before the war. With all the tenement houses, with all the courtyards, with all the streets, this was completely wiped out. Just one last thing. Um, yeah, here it is. Does it work? Yes. So the central square is located now in the most central part in front of the Palace of Culture that has a lot of useful institutions in it, a lot of theaters, a uh, swimming pool, um, two bars, a university, and uh, many, many other things. So it's a great place to be. If you're ever in Warsaw, it's a, it's a great place to go. But the city made also an urban plan at the beginning of the 2000 in order to sort of 
fill this, let's say this, this gap, because what, why it's worth so interesting, it is interesting also because it is the only um, capital in Europe that has, this, does not have a physical city center. You cannot physically feel it because you have this huge parade square that was built in, at the beginning of the 50s in order to receive military parades. So nowadays, I will show it later, is sort of a very sad place. And um, so the city of Warsaw decided to make an urban plan that would sort of fill this place. So right now, two buildings are being built, the Museum of Modern Art, that is designed by Tom Pfeiffer, and this was the building that before that was supposed to be built by Christian Keretz. But for many reasons, uh, the city decided to part with Christian and Christian decided to part with the city uh, for certain, I think, misunderstandings. Um, and the second building is also designed by Tom Pfeiffer. It's, the, it's another theater, a huge theater. So the idea of the city of the of the of the um, of the city of Warsaw was really to sort of finally give to Warsaw this physical center with very important institutions in the center, so people could gather there and start using this place. And this is when, in 2017, the city decided to make a competition for the central square. So getting back to history, we started thinking with the guys, with Sergian, with Martin, with Furio, how do we want to tackle the subject? It's two hectares. It's a lot. It's a huge space. So we needed something to start with. And history in Warsaw is always very present. When you go out of a metro station in the center and you get out of the underground, you are on the crossroad and you see buildings from the 50s and buildings from the 60s and buildings from the 30s, the ones that survived, buildings from the 50s and buildings from the 90s, and then also something more contemporary. So it's like an, an, an amalgamate of a lot of different styles and periods in the 20th century, if you're lucky, from before. So history is always very present. You see the destruction still, but the city, since it receives a lot of funds from the central uh, government and also because it's one of, it's the most, it's the richest city in Poland, it evolves very, very fast. So you see the changing a lot. It's extremely ambitious also. Um, so we decided that this history was very important always. And we, uh, we decided to look back. And we had this idea that maybe what would be interesting is to put the map of uh, pre-war Warsaw on, um, on the perimeter of the square and see if we can get anything from that. So here you can see very well the tenement houses, the footprints of the tenement houses and the courtyards and the streets. This is Jelna. This is the, it's the biggest street of these three. It's Zwota Street and then Vielka. And we decided that if history is so important for, for, for uh, Warsaw, let's check all the historical layers that happen to be on that place, in that place. So we started mapping everything. We went to the office of the Warsaw Conservator and we said, we need, if you have, a DWG of the pre-war Warsaw. I know that you're mapping this for several reasons. I know you have it. We need it really precise. And they were so happy that somebody wants to tackle this topic with history that they became immediately interested and available. And this was the first layer, the pre-war Warsaw. What is important is that, as I told you before, um, the, um, the streets, or the architecture that was there before the war 
was a typical 19th century city. Some people like to say that Warsaw was called the Paris of the East, but it was not like that. I mean, it was, um, it was, a, it was a vivid city. It was, a, it was a, in certain parts, a beautiful city, but it was an extremely provincial city. Uh, before the First World War, Warsaw was part of the Russian Empire, and it was not like St. Petersburg. It was a provincial town, uh, of course, very ambitious for its independence, uh, for the will of the, or its own inhabitants to become independent. But what um, only in the p past few years we started to discuss is that the quality of life in Warsaw, especially in the 19th, uh, in the 19th century tenement houses, was very, very poor. The apartments were extremely dark. Um, very late came the... Um, underground net of um, uh, water and sewage. Um, so the main, the main streets were uh, very representative, but everything that happened in the backs of these streets um, was in, in very pure con uh, poor condition. But it had its charm. Then this guy came. Uh, 1939, um, the Nazi Germany decided to uh, attack Poland on the 1st of September 1939. And um, what they created in 1940, they decided to move one third of the population. You can imagine what type of population. These were the Jewish citizens of Warsaw and to put them in the ghetto. One third of the Warsaw population was put in, um, in the ghetto in very, very poor and bad conditions. And um, since 1942, when the extermination started, they were limiting more and more the ghetto. And more and more people were dying on the streets, first because of hunger and bad uh, hygienic conditions, and then because they were being transported to uh, the extermination camps. But what happened before that, in 1941, the ghetto was built, and in order to um, separate the Jewish citizens of Warsaw from the rest of the, of the city, uh, a ghetto wall was built. And we did consider with the guys that this is another layer that we need to include in our project. Uh, because it's one of the most important, I think, elements, or one of the most um, one of the most important things that happened, urban speaking, let's urban-wise, that happened in in uh, in Warsaw uh, during the Second World War. This is the map of uh, the ghetto, and our part of the wall is here. So just its uh, one of its corners um, was part of today's square. And this, uh, we are not the first one to think about that because these, there, there is a special sign that was, um, well, the city of Warsaw started to put it on the, uh, on the place or on the footprint of the ghetto wall already before, 30 or 40 years ago. And uh, we decided to continue with this tradition and to include this also in our project as another layer of history. Um, in 19, on the 10th of um, April, 1943, uh, there is an uprising in the, in the ghetto. The, Jewish, uh, the Jews decided to uh, fight for their own lives. Only few will um, survive. In the meantime, their neighbors, the Polish citizens of Warsaw, besides helping them um, with um, two organizations, most of the people did not care so much what happened behind the wall. 
Um, but the fate of the city, of the rest of the city, was to be the same. And one year later, on the 1st of August 1944, the rest of Warsaw starts. It's surprising, and it's called the Warsaw Uprising. And it will last till the first days of October 1944. 200,000 civilians will die. And the ghetto was destroyed 100%. The, city of, the rest of the city of Warsaw after the uprising was wiped out by 90%. Hitler was so angry with the Poles when he knew that there is an uprising that when he wo they won, I mean they won, Himmler gave um, an order that no wall higher than four meters needs to stay in the city. So they decided, after they um, sort of defeated the Poles in the uprising, they went from building to building, destroying everything that remained. Then this guy came after the war in 1945. And Poland, although was considered to be part of the Allies and won the war, as also Slovakia and Czechia and Hungary and all of the Eastern Europe went under the yoke of the Soviet Union. And this is where the third layer comes which is these elements of authoritarian architecture that are still visible in the square. So after the footprints of the tenement houses and after the footprints of the ghetto wall, what we can see was the entrance plaza of the Palace of Culture, built together with the palace at the beginning of the 50s the stage for uh, communist politicians to receive military parades, and historical lanterns, all built in social realist style. So this was this heavy style, extremely historical, that would give, um, would give, um, I don't know, um, how do, you see, how do you say podmiotowość in English? Or you don't know. Um, it, it would give presence to the working people. Uh, Stalin would say, give columns to the working people. So it was this extremely heavy, uh, classical style, pastiche of styles, of classical styles. So the communists decided that the 19th century bourgeois city will not be rebuilt. And the legend says that apparently Stalin said that Warsaw can choose between metro, um, a metro, an underground uh, a net, and a palace. And like he was sure that we would choose the metro, but apparently uh, the Polish communists were so eager to give him a monument that they decided to actually build the palace. And the legend says that they went on the other side of the river in order to see how tall the tower should be. So what they did is that they had these balloons on the side of the, where the Palace of Culture is now being built. And the two most important, it was Sigmund Skibniewski, who was an architect, he was a communist architect, very heavily involved with the government. And Lev Rudnev, who was the designer of the, of the palace, and a third person that I don't remember who it was. They were on the other side of the river. They had the radio and they were saying, okay, put the balloon higher. And the guys were putting the balloon higher. And so they were just checking how high it should be with this balloon. And the Poles were so eager to show how communist they are that they just keep on saying higher, higher, higher. And when Lev Rudnev finally said, no guys, okay, that's enough. And this is how they decided on the height of the palace. So once where you had tenement houses, now this white tower raised. And um, a lot of um, builders died during the construction. The conditions on the building side were very bad. 
And besides that, they needed to build it in two years. Uh, it's a steel construction, which is quite strange to see because then it's all cladded in stone. And out of the seven sisters, the seven sisters are the seven uh, towers built in between Moscow, Riga, and Warsaw. This is actually the nicest. So in this uh, um, unlucky thing that we have this building in Warsaw, we are actually lucky that it's the nicest. But now that we have it, we very much, uh, besides of course the um, anti-communists from the generation of my parents who want to, uh, this building to be destroyed. Actually, my generation, the younger generation, we all very much appreciate this building for the social qualities it brings to the city. A lot of institutions are there. We have great parties there also during the weekends. And um, it's extremely generous, generous. Also, the interiors are quite amazing. Uh, they were done with a lot of good materials. So what you can see here is that this, in front of this palace they decided to build a huge square for parades. This is the best part. So in 1966, uh, it was 1,000 year, the celebration of the 1,000 years of the Polish, of the baptism of Poland. And what is strange is they decided to make a huge military parade, the communist, I mean, baptism and communism, uh, which is it's quite strange, no? Because if you're communist, you do not believe in God. You think this uh, religion is the opium for the mass. But they decided to actually celebrate these 1,000 years of baptism. They made a huge military parade with the old historical husaria, which are these is the Poles had this very typical um, um, how do you say it? <laughs> armor thank you armor I'm, I'm tired sorry guys stressed also a bit the, this 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 steel armor with these wings and uh, the Polish cavalry the Polish cavalry was well known in the 16th and 17th century for having this very strange armor. So they decided to make this parade and also uh, to show the contemporary qualities of the Polish army. But the square was also used for many other reasons. There were concerts, there were uh, communist manifestations, because the communist manifestations were the only manifestation that you could have in a communist country. Uh, but also the parades for the 1st of May usually would go, would go um, through that square. But what happened is that this square uh, was also used in the 80s to uh, organize um, the masses when um, the Pope, uh, John Paul II, would come to Poland. Then this guy came. As you can see, we like guys with mustache. Um, and suddenly, in Poland, things started to turn. I mean, we had already some uprising against the communist systems. I would not call them uprising, but sort of, of manifestation, big manifestation. Before 1980s, in 1956, there was the first one. Then in 1968, there was the second one. But in 1980, when Solidarność was born, this was really an important moment in history for uh, Poland, because this is when the communist regi regime in all of Eastern Europe started to crumble. And in the meantime, the square became neglected and forgotten. They decided that actually the transport communication is not so good, so they decided to dig uh, the head of this uh, of the square, uh, a tunnel, in order to connect the Zwota Street with the rest of the square. And after that, the square actually, from being a square for parades in masses and uh, manifestations, became a huge parking lot. It was a parking lot till four months ago when they started finally the construction of our square. In the 90s, 
they decided when communism collapsed and capitalism kicked in, um, the square became a place for um, the um, the sort of um, um, start people started selling their stuff there. And um, as you can see from the pictures, it was not a very attractive space. It was very much sort of guerrilla style, uh, sort of um, a consumerism. And um, um, the, the, these were the first steps of capitalism in Poland. So you would just um, find your own place on that square and start selling whatever you had. But it also became a place where um, yeah, other activities would happen. And slowly in, the, in 2012 also, when we organized the Euro 2012 of Ukraine, it became a huge place for watching football games since its size really uh, sort of could um, accept a lot of people. And it was still a place for manifestations, but mainly it became a place where people would come to take their buses to go back to their own towns because there was a bus terminal there. And when the city decided to uh, redo the competition for the Museum of Modern Art that um, now is being built, Tom Pfeiffer proposed his own interpretation of the central square, which was not so much accepted by the citizens of Warsaw. And in this sort of negative reaction to this project, the city decided to organize a competition for the square. And this is when we kicked in. We started mapping, as I told you, putting all the layers together. And this was our first stage. We decided that besides the three layers that we want to repropose and make an amalgamate of these layers in our project, the fourth layer that would combine all of them or would sort of match them all together was greenery. Because we said that Warsaw is an extremely green city, especially it became green after the Second World War, when uh, a lot of um, sort of pieces of land were transformed into parks because it was a much easier thing to do instead of reconstructing everything. And when um, Sergeant was very often visiting me in Warsaw, we had very long walks, we, and also um, we explained this to Martin and, and to Furio, and we decided maybe what we need to do is to repropose on the footprints of the old tenement houses, big green lawns and a lot of shrubs and trees. And we started to dismantle the elements or to keep the elements of this authoritarian elements of, of, of regime architecture. And like in these English parks, sort of to surround them with greenery. Uh, I don't know if you know the drawings of Piranesi, of Rome, of the ancient Rome elements being overtaken by nature. I'm not talking about the prison drawings of Piranesi that are not so appealing, but uh, the ones that represent the ancient elements of Rome being overtaken by nature. And this was for us one of the most important inspirations. We decided that the only way to tackle these elements is to surround them with greenery. Because this is how you can actually deal with two hectares in the middle of the city. We could all pave it with stone, and then die in, um, in summer, because it emanates so much heat, also during the night. Besides that, um, yeah, having two hectares of paved area in the, cent in the center of the city is not really the best thing you can have. Um, and this is our second stage project. Uh, we were asked to pave 
to make some changes in our project in order to make it a bit more accessible. The idea that we had was extremely radical, but this is also the, the, um, this is also the reason why we were uh, noted by the jury. So if you ever make a competition, it's good to be safe with your idea in order to sort of show that your project is, is uh, plausible, like it's, it's, it's possible to, to build it. But sometimes these radical ideas that you have really can uh, allow you to be noticed by the jury. And we were very lucky because the jury of the competition was made of extremely wise and intelligent people. And they really much appreciated our idea and they said, hey guys, we very much appreciate your radical idea, but can you make it a bit more plausible, please, now? But keep the main idea alive. And this is what we decided to do. Um, change it, but not too much. So, yes, the jury liked it. But when we won, uh, the journalists hated it. And a lot of people hated it. And the day after we won, we rec I received at 8 o'clock in the morning two phone calls from two different newspapers. And they were all asking about the flying pig on our render. And they were like, can you tell us what the uh, flying pig represents in your rendering? And I said, but do we want to talk about the project or only about the pig? And they said, no, about the pig. And I said, okay, so thank you, but I'm not interested. Um, that's just a story. Um, my favorite was, my favorite article that appeared one week after we won in the biggest um, opinion newspaper in Poland was entitled Nine Deadly Sins of the Central Square. And this is, the, this is how this article started. I consider it a mistake to allow the work of the AA collective team to be the, final of the, uh, the finalists of the competition for the Central Square. Not to mention recognizing it as the best. It is defended only at the level of an architectural happening or an intellectual exercise from a student diploma thesis. And then we were attacked because nobody like, believed that this mapping could actually be seen by the citizens because you would have to actually see it from the top of the Palace of Culture to appreciate it. Which I... I um, I don't think it is like this. Um, I, I think that it's also important that you believe in the intelligence of the people that will use your, the space that you design, and that not everything has to be literal. That you can discover step by step the building that you're using or the square that you're using. And we thought, yes, from the site, like from the eye side, maybe you will not recognize what it is. But slowly, step by step, if you will start discovering the square, after a while you will realize what you're actually stepping on. And it's also a game. Architecture is not only serious stuff. It's also about giving a chance to, your, like, to the users to discover things to see references. This is why architecture is fun. You can read it as a book. We were also attacked by the, um, um, by the politicians of um, the sort of far-right party. Um, just because a week, one week before we won, they lost the elections for the, mayor, uh, for the position of the mayor of Warsaw. And they said, just to go back, that, um, yeah, President Trzaskowski, who won, withdraws from further promises, garbage, cheap tickets, education, he enlarges the administration, and now this project for a small provincial town and not the capital of Poland. So, this is our project. You can see the main idea. We keep this, or we repropose the old streets as the paved area of the city, of the square. We 
we make the footprints of the old tenement houses as these big lawns with trees where people can rest during spring and summer, with trees that give you shadow, and, but they also protect you from the wind in the winter, maybe from the rain a bit. So it really becomes a sort of an amalgamate between a park and a, and, a, and a square, but it's always a public space. Also because in the center, this is one of the uh, uh, changes that we do, or w one of the particularities of the project. We pave it with stone, but with, um, with a fugue of five centimeters where we um, fill it with grass to keep this notion of, of greenery on the footprints. We repropose the footprints of the old courtyards as little squares where people can gather and have different activities. So there is another square here, and another here, and another here, and here. We plant 109 trees. If you ask me why 109, I tell you this is because we found space for 109 trees, because you have such a thick and chaotic underground net of electricity and sewage that we just, it was like playing um, this game where you ask your friend where did he put his um, ship? I know, yeah? 9B, 7A. Uh, this was, for us, planting trees was like playing this game. I would propose something and then my friend would say, no, there is an underground net there. Move it there. And um, so there's like, there's no symbolism in 109. Um, and I think that one of, the, one of the reasons for which we were attacked the most was, were two things. We decided to keep the stage, and we decided to put the old Zwota Street exactly as it went before the war. And by putting it not in the axis of the Palace of Culture, you take out this authoritarian notion of this authoritarian space. You tackle the authoritarian space by moving or shifting the axis. And uh, the Warsaw Conservator was so mad about it that he said that it's great that we won, but he will do anything to convince us to sort of put the axis of the Zwota Street on the axis of the building. And we said, no guys, this is exactly the opposite. We, we cannot do it. And we said no from the beginning. And the director of the city, of the um, architecture office of the city said, I stick with the guys. She trusted us and she said that this is actually a very good way in order to sort of dismantle this authoritarian um, composition. And she convinced also the conservator, which is a great thing. We were attacked for keeping the stage because of course the anti-communists said that there is no need of keeping this element. But we decided, we said, if we keep all the layers, we keep everything. This is the plan where you can see exactly our idea. One of the most important things that we wanted to achieve is to give different spaces or different quality of spaces uh, all around the square for different activities. So one of the footprints also becomes a little pond with water. And on the other side, closer to the Palace of Culture, we make the negative of our idea. Also because the, um, the paved area was considered to be a historical monument, so they asked us to reduce the minimum of it and to introduce the minimum of greenery uh, in, um, within our idea but to combine our idea with the possibility of keeping as much pavement from this entrance plaza of the Palace of Culture. And this is when we decided that, okay, then in this case maybe we can change and repropose the footprints of the old um, courtyards of the tenement houses 
as these green elements. So on the lower plaza, they become little squares. On the upper plaza, they become little gardens. It was very important from the beginning, our collaboration with Marta Tomasiak and her landscape practice. Without Marta, I don't think this project would be, would be so good. Uh, she was a very important element of our, uh, of our team. And uh, I very, um, we, we collaborated on a daily basis. We found an office, uh, office space together, and, um, and she proposed to, uh, uh, she did all the landscape uh, design. So what we, what she had in mind as an idea is to have, sorry guys, just check if it's not too long. Oh no, I still have 10 minutes. Okay, I will rush. Um, have this idea of having these areas with sort of different combination of trees. So around the pond, you would have the ginkgo biloba that would give you in uh, autumn a beautiful yellow color around the pond. I was obsessed with magnolias that apparently um, are not so good. I mean, there is not such a big possibility of them surviving in our climate, but Marta said that now with the climate change, there is actually a huge possibility they will survive. I was obsessed with magnolias because I love the flowers of them. And we also wanted to have the cherry trees because we wanted to have as much color in the spring as possible, not only limit ourselves to green leaves. So the idea was to have small trees around the main crossroad and then grow with the trees the more we would go to the borders. Um, fruit trees here, anyways, which um, will be beautiful also because the mm, the this different types of trees would give to the square different kind of colors all around the year. So this, this notion of the color was also very important in our perception of the space. We also did uh, like this exonometry that would show to the, to, the, to the city how we intended to use the square. It can be a square that, although it has a lot of greenery and a lot of trees, it can be still used in different ways. So we can imagine that along the main roads, you could do the Christmas market. Or you could, on this part of the square that is larger because of its paved uh, areas, surfaces, you can organize a concert for 13,000 people, 16,000 people. This is what our fire guys said. Uh, you can use the pond. You have the Museum of Modern Art that can always exhibit on the outside, uh, maybe do some, um, uh, I don't know, um, artist intervention. Uh, we, can, we can put an ice skating uh, um, element. I mean, there are a lot of ways to use the square. You can also do a festival, of, you can also put food trucks along the streets, so it can really be used in many, many, many ways. We repropose uh, re also the old um, sidewalks, and the, um, we redesign the streets that are a reinterpretation of the granite pavement from before the war but we do it with the more, more accessible and uh, granite from Silesia. And this is how the square looks, or how the square will look, hopefully, in a couple of years. We have to take into consideration that we can plant the trees that are maximum 15 meters high. They will be from 7 to 13, 14, 15. So, we will also have to be patient, uh, I think, to be honest. Before the square really will look like in these renderings, we will need a couple of years. But what is cool about architecture is that if you're patient enough, it pays. This is the pond during uh, autumn. And this is the upper plaza 
with the entrance to the Palace of Culture. Two last things. The project was blocked uh, last year for several reasons. The city had other priorities and there was a problem with receiving the building permit, uh, blah, blah, blah. So a couple of activities, activi activities, ac activists, activi activists, yes, activists, from Warsaw decided that what we would could do in order to sort of remind the city that they have in, uh, in their offices actually a great project is to repropose a part of the old courtyards as a happening on the, of the, on the upper plaza of the Palace of Culture to make a happening to um, recreate half of this um, courtyard and to transform it in, in these um, in this flower bed and uh, the city gave an okay so we decided we found money to do it and we uh, took out all the, stone, all the stones uh, in that particular area and uh, all the concrete and we made a flower bed and the users of the Palace of Culture were so amazed with this little thing that we did because we also put the renderings of the square next to it that this is how the square can look in the future that the reaction was so positive that the city decided to do something about it. And four months ago, we started the construction. A very important element in our project, and this is the last, these are the last slides. So, yeah, I know that the attention span is sort of difficult after one hour and 10 minutes. So last five slides. A very important element in our square was the reuse of the existing stone. So the first thing that we did, it was we meticulously put all the stone that was still in good shape and we're going to clean it and we're going to reuse it in our square. But while building, we found things that we were not sort of, we did not know exist. Apparently, there were rooms under, underground that were not used since the 50s. And not even the people from the Palace of Culture knew that actually they, would, they, they existed. And when we did the mapping of the square, once we were already preparing the documentation, we could not access there because to access to this room, in order to um, open this, to open this hall, they needed this machine to move it. And once we entered there, nobody wanted to believe that actually these rooms still exist. And they were not mapped on the maps. But we found something else. Actually, the city that we were, sort of the footprints of the city that we were reproposing was two meters underneath the ground. Like, very well preserved. Actually, what we came to know is that there was a tram line and with the steel elements still. So we started digging. And what we realized is that most of it is still there. Tiles, bottles, lamp elements, paved areas, sidewalks, streets, elements of the wall. This is from the 12th floor of the Palace of Culture. It's a picture I received one week ago from one of the um, officials, um, 
civil servants from the city of uh, Warsaw who is responsible for the contacts with me when, whenever there is something on the square. I go regularly back to Warsaw from Switzerland every two weeks to supervise the project. I was having a critique with my student when I received the message and uh, I saw the picture and Adrian, who is the guy, told me, look what we found. Um, we don't know what's going to happen now. Well, the conservator want to, uh, needs to um, map everything, document everything. What I would really like us to do or, uh, is to maybe reuse some of the materials of the street because they would be quite amazing to do. We cannot, we cannot make our square lower to actually use this street because then the access to the Palace of Culture and to the surrounding buildings would not, be, would not be functional. But what we can do maybe is to convince the city to reuse these elements again, resurface them. Um, history is cool. Architecture also. But I think the future is the most important thing. But it's good to think about the future and look back once in a while because you can start to find things that really can help you out in your design, but also in your life. So don't always only look in front, sometimes look back. And that's it, thank you guys. Thank you so much. This was really exciting. I, I did not expect this kind of detective story <laughs> with this point at the, at the end. Great. It's a, thank well, you. And uh, I, I would like to thank you for the last words because try to remember on our lessons of the history of architecture, this is what, what I said always, like you should learn the history because you can uh, deal with it in your project so I mean <laughs> thank you thank you very much <laughs> okay so now it's your turn dear students so please questions remarks <laughs> yes please <laughs> as always <laughs> yes there is because we are recording it okay so for the audience online as well and for the history uh, I would like to ask you about your colleagues because everything you showed us uh, it's really contextual and for us Slovaks it's easy to understand it and feel the mentality of, of the century and all the his big historical events but your colleagues are from different backgrounds so how was or what was their approach to this interesting the very important thing for Polish people. Uh, Sergian was born in Yugoslavia, so he has this sort of uh, big love for Eastern Europe. So with him, I did not have to um, explain anything. He was also very interested in history, so uh, both of my parents are majored in history. So with Sergian, I was sort of brought up in this house where we would always discuss history. So, and Sergeant was also very interested in that, so with him I found this sort of particular connection. But what I think, why this project was possible, is also because Martin and Furio were sort of, um, they did not know a lot, but their ability to see things with fresh eyes made us uh, notice certain things that maybe we would find too literal or too superficial as extremely important elements, as elements that, would, uh, that maybe we would tend to neglect. And what also helped is that in Poland, as I said, history is so important that, and it's so divisive, it divides the society also, the way in which you um, put yourself um, 
in what is your interpretation of certain uh, important historical uh, moments also puts, puts you on one of the sides uh, in this, let's say, um, conflict. And when you show the city and these historical elements and historical periods to people that are not emotionally attached to it, they are much, it's much easier for them to see uh, positive aspects in it. So I think that Martin and Furio were essential, and also Serjan were essential to me to, be, to show me that I can see my own city and my own history through different lenses. So I think it's important that you, when you tackle a subject like this, that you have somebody who knows the context, but it's also very important to have somebody who doesn't know who can see it with fresh eyes and confront it. So, um, yeah, I think they were essential for the success of this project. And I hope that for the success also of this, of this built uh, square. More questions? Hello. Hey, thank you so much. This was absolutely awesome. I really enjoyed it. But I'm still blown by the last picture that you've shown, the excavations. Like, I can't process it, <laughs> so please help. Because, <laughs> like, is it, is it like the best thing that could happen or the worst thing that, can, that could happen? Like, do you wish you wouldn't dig so deep? Or, I mean, you just, <laughs> you just, like, uh, you know, you made visible the history that you wanted to bring back in, but in the actual way, not in the abstract way that people are complaining that it's not understandable. So what, I mean, is it going to postpone the whole project or like, do you think you're just going to like leave it as a, as a whole for a while so people can actually see what you've been talking about the whole time? <laughs> we cannot leave it as it is for the very simple reason that the heights of the square uh, are given and we need to reach these heights. So now the height of the square that was before we started construction was already one meter and 20 underneath the given uh, height. To be honest, for the construction, this is the worst thing could happen. Yeah, I'm just like picturing something like Forum Romanum in Rome, you know, like you can see this is, like This is the worst thing under. that could happen for a very simple reason that uh, it will postpone our construction but at least half a year. But for historical reasons and let's say for the power of, for, for, for the project itself, it's very good this happened. I think because uh, this gives us even more elements or um, um, more ways and possibilities to tackle now the project when we're going to build it. Maybe some of the elements we will be able to reuse and this would be the best. I think that it mostly gives the credibility to your design yes. because like people were already like dissociated from the past but now you made it you know, that's, that's being seen, actually. That's uh, very true, yes. Yeah, perhaps you can excavate and elevate the, the, the layers, I don't know, because probably they are quite like, I would say... With the balloons. Yeah, with the balloons, <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> with the balloons. No, but uh, they must be like uh, of worth, like they are valuable for, for historians and, and for the monument protection in Warsaw, I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we still don't know what's going to happen to it. And it's, we can, the truth is, guys, if you're architects and you want to do something, uh, you can try as much as you want, but if there is no political will to do it, nobody will allow you to do it. That's the sad thing about architecture and public space and public architecture. But I think that you can try as much as you can in order to influence the political decision and this is why you should never give up. By the way, what about the cages? Ah, oh, this will go. <laughs> no, but this was crazy, I mean... What is uh, it, kind of a, of a prison or what, what No, I that? think it was used for keeping some stuff for the, for the, for these, uh, I think, uh, Military I don't know. Military parades, like small... I don't know, mode. maybe it was a prison, but I don't think so. So, yeah, but anyways, um, this, this they will have to dismantle, they will have to cover it with, um, with earth. 
but with these elements, especially the, the, can the sellers of the old tenement houses, because this is what we saw in the last picture, um, this for sure now needs to be mapped and, uh, and we cannot do anything about it because these are just brick walls. But there is going to be now a second tender for digging even deeper these cellars. So this is why it's going to take six months. But they are very curious what they're going to find. Actually, this, this, this element here that I'm showing, this was supposed to be the plinth for the monument of Stalin. Uh, it was a huge three meters deep concrete plinth for this huge monument that was supposed to be standing in front of the Palace of Culture, but Stalin died and they forgot about By it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank God. So perhaps you can erect yeah. the monument. But <laughs> even here, even here you can see these historical elements. These are electrical tubes that go above the old street and this is the monument of a Stalin, uh, I mean this is a plinth of a monument, uh, Stalin monument that never like, was built. That square could basically be like an open air museum of yes. Warsaw. <laughs> yeah, but it also has to be used by the Warsaw citizens. So this is why it's, it's very important for us that we give them the possibility to do it. I mean, it's absolutely perfect that it happened because it really b brought the, the, the place to the discussion and it's yes. like, it's, you should be lucky, actually. <laughs> very much. Even if it's a little bit postponed, but... Yeah, I know, but we're very comes. happy we're doing it and, yeah, we cannot wait to see it finished. There are some more questions. Oh. Bring. God. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the presentation and... Um, I would like to ask you, uh, you've said a lot of things about the programs that can be used, like mm -hmm. what people can do uh, in the square, but were you thinking also about using it for the huge political manifestations and uh, demonstrations? Because now when you put like all the uh, grass areas in the footprint of the former buildings, wouldn't it be destroyed if, for example, I don't know, 10,000 people marched there and wouldn't it be destroyed? I think that there is a risk. I mean, to be honest, uh, of course I could say no, but I think there is always a risk. But uh, political manifestation is something that uh, does not happen on an everyday basis. And this needs to be also a square that can be used on a daily basis. And most, all of the other projects that uh, started in the competition, they had this huge plaza paved because they use this argument of political manifestation of concerts and everything and we said yeah but concerts maybe you will organize a new year's eve concert and maybe then you will use it, do another concert uh, after four months but that's it you will not do it every day and we want this square to be used every day so this is what we said it's either this or that and of course manifestation can happen because there is enough paved area. If there's going to be a big manifestation, we're going to replant the grass. They will stand in a pool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. This was exactly the discussion uh, about our uh, square of, of freedom here in front of the faculty that, uh, yeah, that there used to be manifestations and now they're simply recreate more paved um, floor because of that, that it will happen. And um, I mean, it would be much clever to have more grass there, yeah. <laughs> more trees, yeah. Actually, that's my opinion. Okay, some more questions, uh, dear colleagues. Yes. I have a train at quarter past Okay, eight. so you should be fast <laughs> because there is a train wait, uh, not really waiting for <laughs> I'm very happy there is a lot of questions, guys, now, to be honest, really. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fast, don't worry. Uh, so thank you for the lecture. I have a more practical question about the way you're working, so how your team is spread through Europe. And I think a lot of us have sort of experienced it during pandemic, that we had to work from home or distance and show things through, like, Google, meetings, Teams, something. And I think a lot of us could find it... Um, a little bit frustrating in a way. It's hugely How, frustrating. Yes, thank you. And so I was wondering if you ever just feel like, oh my God, why can't we just live a little bit closer and just have this normal meeting? Or if you feel that it sort of adds something to your project, then you have to be more maybe clear or articulate or really sort of like really, really try to, to make a point. This is the most discussion. unsustainable, uneconomical, 
uh, model that we could choose. Uh, it makes no sense. But we sort of did this. Uh, we did the whole document. I mean, I did the whole documentation because I was responsible for the Warsaw project, and I was there, and I was the only person speaking in Polish. But all the designs that we did, all the competitions we did on Skype, it was not very much sustainable. But we sort of managed. And I think it's just the will. If there is enough will, you can do it. Of course, it's not functional, but I mean, you can succeed. But I have to be honest. The collective works because we decided to do, after a couple of years where we saw that this is not sustainable, each one of us has its own office where we do things that can sustain us economically. But since we are very good friends and we like working together, we gather once or twice a year and we do projects for ideas, competitions for ideas. If there is a Biennale, we do it together. Because for us, it's extremely important that it's, architecture is not only about building, but also about thinking. So we want to remain in the discourse. So this is the only moment where we can stop thinking about how you design the next bathroom, but actually how you want to think about architecture. And it's so great, even on Skype, to discuss with the guys and quarrel and fight. Actually, the first picture that I showed you of us four, it was after a huge fight. You could see Furio uh, wandering with his eyesight and the, uh, like not wanting to see Martin and Martin trying to explain something, Sergi being bored and me sort of still not understanding what the ha hell happened. But this is also how we did projects. We were fighting a lot. But sort of, we did something, so, and we hope on doing something in the future also. Thank you. Great, I mean, this could be a beautiful conclusion that it's not always about uh, money and business, it could be about love and passion. Yes. <laughs> so, so, we keep our fingers crossed for, for your nice team and good luck for your thank next you. projects and thank you very much. For